Hi, Jim. No. Hello. How's the technology working so far? That's cool. It's, it's working fine. Yeah, you're in glorious Technicolor. For those that don't know, I, I, I know that John won't mind me doing this. Uh, John was the first Westerner to be employed by Toyota back in 84, John. Is that right? 84? Well, employed in Toyota City, we should in say. Toyota so there City. There were a lot of employees in uh, yeah. Europe and yeah, the no, in US Japan. or wherever, yes. Yeah, in Japan. And one of his early jobs was he was asked to transfer the Toyota production system to their first overseas plant, which was the new United Motor Manufacturing Inc. in Fremont, California, um, which was a joint venture between General Motors and Toyota. Okay? So he's, he's, he, yes. he's pretty uniquely qualified to talk about this transfer to a different culture, a different environment, and, and so on. Um, you're also um, the manager at Toyota Supplier Support Center, which actually is kind of like a sister to the guys from Toyota Lean Management Center um, that's, uh, that, that, that are hosting us on, on Thursday. And, um, and you also were then a senior advisor at Lean Enterprise Institute before taking over from Jim Womack, and then a senior, uh, then the chairman of the Lean Global Network. And um, of course, he wrote Learning to See and Managing to Learn. So in a, in a world where lots of these lean guys want to be rock stars, this guy's the rock star, okay? So, wow. um, okay, so. <laughs> So, so, so during my introduction, I explained what we've been doing during the pandemic. And um, the hypothesis that we're testing is that by using these processes and learning materials, we can p help people become self-reliant in applying lean thinking and practice. One of our decisions early on was that to agree how we would organize everything. And what we did was we chose to organize everything around the Lean Transformation Framework, or LTF for short. And what John and I are going to do is we're going to unpick the LTF, explain a little bit more about it. And so I'm going to hand over to John, and we're just going to start with some history. So John, you shared this in 2014 as the Lean Transformation Model, and we, you changed the name. Um, how was it developed? Okay, well, let's actually let's spend a couple of moments here. Uh, once again, good morning, everyone. I do wish I could be there uh, with you. Um, I really enjoyed the the, uh, the presentation from the what National Audit Office by uh, Mr. Steele. In fact, some of the things that he was working through, his last question was about how many of these issues might might uh, resonate with some of you, and I bet they resonate with many of you a lot. Um, because it gets into this uh, question uh, that Dave asked me to, to, to address this morning. How is this thing we call uh, frame, the framework, the Lean Transformation Framework? I hate the name, uh, but it's one that we landed on. It kind of says what it is. Um, it sounds kind of, uh, I, just, I don't love the ring of it, but uh, it is uh, a framework that was developed trying to th uh, through a process of thinking about <clears throat> how companies, how organizations, how individuals can go through a process of embodying this thinking and this way of working. So there were three, I think, things we can point to uh, as, as to, 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 to try to describe how, how it came about. And one is reflections on failure modes and success factors over years of working with and observing many organizations, uh, just as the one we just uh, just heard about. Uh, reflections on the teaching of a substantial collection of Master Lean Sensei, uh, which is something that um, uh, I, I, I was, have been fortunate uh, to 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 benefit from from having a lot of uh, interactions with some of these Master Lean Sensei. Many of them uh, have left us now. Uh, and then reverse engineered the thinking that went into the development of the TPS house, uh, whether this original one, as we see here, or the or the Toyota Way 2001. So the first one there is kind of the easiest. It's the thing that you would think that any of us do, uh, that many of you have done, uh, many of you are doing now, whether it's just regarding your own organization or your current organization or others you've worked with. 
you see things work, you see things don't work. So one thing, one of the things that happens when you get involved in this lean thinking and practice or TPS is you fall in love with it. If you give it just any chance, if you give it any chance at all, you will absolutely will change your life. And we see this, we experience this, we know this to be true. And yet we also see that many people reject it. They don't give it a chance. And they don't then benefit from the tremendous opportunities that it presents. Uh, for example, again, this morning's presentation, uh, one thing is bringing this into our own work in our organization our, or, or, or to our organization uh, company-wide. The other is even more broadly, you know, the huge challenges that we face. I think many, I think any of us, when you look at this, you can see how this thinking and way of approaching problems can work with anything, including our most vexing problems. So I've had the chance of, of, uh, of seeing many <laughs> uh, uh, successes over the years and many failures over the years uh, uh, as well. Now, Dave just mentioned NUMI, the joint venture between Toyota and General Motors, and that is why Toyota hired me in 1983, it was, uh, before NUMI was up and running, and that was a success. But I saw what happened after that is General Motors, our partner, had tried to bring that system into its own operations uh, and failed, struggled mightily and mainly failed miserably, but not, not, not totally. But uh, that's just two examples of many, many that, that, that many of us, not only me, have seen over the years. So you break this apart, try to think about how, you know, what, what is it that contributes to success? And what are some, there are some characteristic failure modes uh, that you see time and again. So how can we identify those and how could that then inform the way we go about introducing or, or actualizing TPS in the real world? Um, I'll jump to the third one now. Toyota itself has always said, my sensei back in 1983, 1984 said the same things, that TPS was not developed as some sort of idealized model. It was not engineered up front. This is what this looks like. This is what we're going to try to do. Specific situational challenges drove its evolution. It wasn't named until a good 30 or 40 years after it really the development really started. It wasn't formulated into this house that we all love. I love this house. I probably taught this house more than anyone to, to, to huge numbers of people over the decades. But they told us over the years that it's not a matter of implementing these artifacts. It's a matter of understanding your situation, the problems in it. And that's what they did. And that resulted in, after the fact, something that you can conceptualize as this house. And, and in fact, that, that takes me back then to the number, the second one there, reflections on the teaching of a substantial collection of master sensei. If you look at what they were all trying to do as they were going into a new operation, transforming something or forming something from the beginning, they didn't just say, okay, where can I put in, you know, any, any number of the, of the tools and techniques on the house that you see there or the ones that are underneath that that, that aren't shown there. It wasn't a matter of just putting those in place. It was a matter of understanding the situation and applying then certain thinking and then uh, uh, characteristic practices to to that. So that's a uh, again, I think there's a lot there, Dave. And if we have time for questions and or discussion later, we can talk about that uh, perhaps some more. OK. So. Really, what you're saying is in terms of the lean transformation framework, and using the house, you use the house metaphor for the LTF, um, but you didn't use the TPS house. That's as, right. As That's it right. stands, and that, and that really links back to this idea of reverse engineering the thinking. I think that's it. Totally does. Yeah. Okay. It, to it totally does. So just just to um, be clear. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it does. So why not just use TPS applied to a situation? Well, I think actually we are using TPS applied to a situation. Yeah. But you're approaching the situation with questions. Instead of saying, where can I pl apply this tool? You're asking, what does the situation need? And it will take you to the same place and sometimes very quickly. Yeah, it will take you to a very sim similar place. But when we say when I say we are doing this, applying TPS, it's TPS defined as the thinking production system. <laughs> Not just the uh, Toyota production system. There's one of the very wise old master sensei at, at, at Toyota that some decades ago said, uh, TPS is good. You know, oh no, the developer of TPS, uh, he didn't like the name. He didn't want to name it at all. He said, if we name it, we'll kill it. 
Um, and they were calling it the Ono system. He said, well, anything is better than that. He didn't want that. And they ended up calling it the Toyota uh, production system. And years later, uh, there was one uh, individual who said, okay, think of the T as not standing for Toyota, but thinking. So if the challenge is how to apply the thinking to our situation, just looking at the, uh, you know, the, the original house as we see it there can lead us astray. Well, necessarily, if you work through each of those pieces long enough, you will get to the same place, I, I believe. But it's possible to be led astray, to focus only on those pieces, the artifacts. You have to get beyond the artifacts. A quick, uh, quick, uh, quick example. In the case, why not just use TPS? Well, in the case of NUMI, uh, the joint venture with General Motors and Toyota in Fremont, California, going 1980s, we did just apply TPS. That's all we had to do. We put in everything. We put in all the systems, product, and process designed in Toyota City and brought over. The people systems, uh, how the management system work, all brought over, put in place. All the TPS tools, Jidoka, Just-in-Time, Kanban, uh, all of it, uh, standardized work, all of it was there. And that's okay. So then one of my first, I guess, the uh, experiences in trying to reverse engineer this was watching General Motors. Part of my job, in fact, was to teach General Motors people an interesting situation. I was hired by Toyota uh, to, to, to assist in the process of taking TPS overseas as a whole system for the first time. They'd never done this before. Uh, so one strength was recognizing his, his a great source of strength is to recognize one's weaknesses. And uh, they recognized they didn't know how to do this. So one small thing was to hire one American to work on in Toyota City on that side of things to help figure out how this would need how this would work uh, in Fremont, California. And what we found then is that General Motors was able to copy the artifacts quite well. People have often asked me over the years, why didn't why didn't General, General Motors had a close up look at this? Why didn't they implement this? Actually, they did remarkably well, but there were some key pieces that they missed absolutely fundamental, essential pieces that they were not able to, to, to bring. The change was so deep, they were not able to bring it about in the company. And for the, to some degree, they weren't even, even able to recognize what those were. So that's why we developed these uh, set of questions. I don't know if it was a good idea, Dave, or a bad idea to, to construct it looking like the, uh, the TPS house. Uh, I think that may distract some. I think it helps some people and it distracts others. Um, at the end of the day, I think we're going to try to go to the same place. But what happened in General Motors, for example, look at the very first question. They were able to put in place, and I've seen, we've seen this time and again, we think about failure modes, where a company may be quite successful in bringing in some of the TPS practices in a certain part of the organization. But the fundamental thrust of that organization is in a completely different direction. It's not trying to lead to the same place that Toyota was trying to go. It's not informed by the same fundamental philosophies and basic thinking that informed Toyota as it was going through this process. So clearly then, or it's not, it's not a strange to think that if such a situation would bring about a uh, failure. So this questions, this approaching it through questions is something that we landed on as a key uh, factor. And this goes back to my time, in my, especially in my last uh, job with Toyota, as you mentioned, was the Toyota Production System Support Center, where our job was to try to help organizations uh, actualize uh, TPS. And there's where I was guided through a study process, actually. I was given an assignment once by one of these master sensei to try to figure out the different methods that even inside Toyota, different organizations would use to introduce TPS to, uh, to, to suppliers. And what that study showed was some parts of even Toyota would go walk in trying to introduce the techniques. They would look, they would look, well, where can we put in Kanban? Where can we put in Pokeoke? -okay? But there were others, more experienced and say they would go in and they weren't asking, they weren't looking at it that way at all. They were saying, what is the fundamental purpose of this facility, this factory, this company? Why is it here? What does it exist for? What value is it creating? And from there, what kind of work does it need to do to do that, to accomplish that purpose? Then what kind of skills are, are required and how, how are we going about developing those skills in, in our company? But then we can think about what people want to jump to often, which is the leader behaviors and management system and all that. And then what happens is sometimes you, you can actually go through all that and still never actually step back and take, look at, take a look at what is our fundamental thinking? How do we think the world works? And how do, how do we think about our existence and the existence of our enterprise? 
So that's what this questioning approach, I think, tries to accomplish, Dave. Okay. So you, you had a couple of... Um... So you had a couple of things about question in mind. Do you want to, do you want to talk to us about that? Yeah, you know, so uh, uh, Claude Levi-Strauss is an anthropologist. Uh, I myself, when I in graduate school, I cobbled together something that I called uh, 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 graduate studies in, in industrial anthropology, just made that up. But I definitely was inspired by this notion of what anthropology is, which is to look and try to understand how, how, how organic uh, uh, organizations uh, and people uh, work in, in this world. And as Claude Levy Strauss put it, the scientific mind does not so much provide the right answers as ask the right questions. I think there's a lot of wisdom there. If you go back to the scientific revolution of a few centuries ago, what made that a revolution wasn't that we suddenly understood more about how the stars and planets uh, uh, work together. It's because we finally recognized as humans that we don't know everything, <laughs> that, but that we have a method that we can use to understand greater. That was what the revolution was. So it's a, it's a que- scientific mind, I believe, is a questioning mind. So we can approach trans- changing ourselves in the same way. And another wonderful quote, Nobel Prize winner, you can tell whether a person is clever by their answers. So I can walk in, and I learned along the way to kind of walk into a company. I learned eventually how to be able to do things that my sensei could do, which is walk into a facility and pretty quickly see how this thing could, should be reconfigured uh, in a lean flow. And, and it should look like a, 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 it's called a lean factory. But just giving those answers uh, can help. Sometimes you might even do that. But what you're trying to get at is something deeper, and that is uh, that is the second part of, of his quote, which is you can tell whether the person is wise by their questions. So I think a questioning approach is something that was worth exploring, which is, again, what kind of led us to develop this. Yeah. Dave. Yeah. Okay. So a so, bit more specific then. Fundamental yes. questions to be addressed then the thinking that underlies the questions, then the actions. T- take, that's right, that's take, right, that's right. So, that. so, th- so this, this, this little logic flow, I think, is really important. So we have these questions, the fundamental ones to be addressed. We've come up with some. It's not hammered in stone. Uh, it might be, there might be a different set. And certainly in a situ- certain situation, you could begin in a different way. But underneath that are some thinking, this thinking production system. What is that thinking and how to get at it? And then finally, you get to your situational action, which is what you're going to do to achieve what you want to achieve. And as the next slide shows, I think to me, a big this was a big thing that drove me, Dave, as we were putting this together. If I looked at failure modes over the years, this one has been huge, which is companies, leaders implementing artifacts of TPS and then mandating that throughout the organization without people understanding why. Well, who is it? Simon Sinek that says, you know, start with why. I don't know that you have to start with why, but you have to get to why fairly quickly at some point along the way. And this, we say hammer looking for a nail or check the box syndrome is so rampant. And if you look at what a lot of companies have tried to do with lean, uh, with their implementations of uh, TPS, that's what it is. They're saying we're trying to be lean. We're going to bring, we're going to bring lean into our company as opposed to thinking about what is it they want to be as an organization. And that should start first. That should come first, I think. Yeah. So okay. we can break these down a little bit. So if I, I'll go maybe through these next few, you know, just, just kind of flow through them. Yeah, yeah. Um, so each of, the, each of these boxes, the questions, the thinking, the actions, has underneath this something more specific. So there are those questions we've come up with, and it has in, it's in these categories. We'll look at them. You, I think you already mentioned them, Dave, but we can yeah. look at them again. And then there's some underlying thinking. Now, this is just a kind of a starter list. This isn't the, isn't the full list of what that would be. Um, and, but then there are the actions. And these are the things that are more familiar to us. These are the things you can see when you walk into any company. You can see certain things. The, so the artifacts is, a good, uh, is one way to think of it. But the actions that we take. So each of these, the next three slides, they, we have kind of, we've broken each of these down. Now, I don't, you know, often in a talk like this, go into such detail about this, uh, but, but, uh, I think that's how this is how you structure, you know, your event is around the LTF. So I think it's worth doing so. So these are the questions, the basic questions that we start with. And they, they, you know, they, they guide our thinking. I believe I, I think you can make an argument that our thinking as humans is guided by certain questions. Uh, we, we like to think about first principles. I think Elon Musk talks a lot about first principles, and that's wonderful. But even those come from some kind of question, some kind of question about how things work. Uh, so I think we can consider any statement or, or of principle. People like to also start with guiding principles. 
That's preceded by a question, is it not? Or certainly when we're going to try to introduce new ideas to someone, let's, starting with a question, I, I, it, and more often than not, can be an effective way to do so. So what's our purpose, the value to create, what problem? The way we, <laughs> the question that Toyota folks use a lot is what problem are you trying to solve? Can't tell you, I was just, I'll be asked that all the time. I'll be working on something, making good progress, kind of proud of it. And then since they walks in, well, what problem are you trying to solve here? And, you know, and you sometimes kind of stop and think, well, gee, I don't know, I'm not sure. And how does it connect to a higher level, uh, a purpose or strategy? Again, kind of reflect, kind of, kind of connecting back to what Alex Steele was talking about. He was connecting strategy with operations, something that is broken in almost every organization I see. Then how do we design the work, do it, and how do we improve the actual work? You go straight there. That's one thing characteristic of lean thinking. Is, is we want to understand what problem we're trying to solve and then what needs to be done mechanically, physically, what needs to be done to solve that. Then developing capabilities uh, of the end of, uh, so the organization is able to do the work that needs to be done to solve the problem, to achieve the purpose. And then the management system leader behaviors. Again, we've, we've constructed this, uh, this set of questions so that those two are, com you could say those are two different questions. I think they're so related, we, we combine them into one. Um, but you could say that you could separate them if you wanted to. Uh, and then there's this thing at the bottom, which is sometimes so hard to get at, our underlying assumptions uh, that, that, that inform how we approach moment to moment. So this is the first place. This is the, this is the first step of this logical flow. And the next one, the thinking, it starts to get closer to the things that we've typically learned about or read about when you read a lean book. It talks a lot about you know certain things to do with the thinking, value. This is something that uh, Jim Womack and Dan Jones uh, contributed that was so important with the book Lean Thinking, um, uh, which is it begins with value. You know, until then, you know, Toyota TPS guys had talked a lot about waste, eliminating waste. Well, you can't eliminate waste unless you know what value is, um, especially if you start thinking about what precedes the factory, designing the value first. And that is defined by the need of the customer or what and we define as we begin our organizations by asking, you know, what value do I want to provide? Uh, from their humanity, respect for the humanity, the people who do the work, and we obsess over that. We we want to understand the work people are doing. We want to understand and under and know that it's being done effectively, but also that it's being designed in a way that the individuals doing uh, who are doing it are being uh, given the respect that they deserve. And then scientific thinking and doing, PDCA, Kaizen, you know, continuous improvement, continuous innovation, art and craft of science, and then what I call here the three goods. That's an old Japanese uh, uh, thing going back several hundred years ago, uh, which uh, every, every Japanese uh, uh, executive <clears throat> has learned from the time they were uh, quite young, which is to think about how can we sustainably satisfy and even delight our customer directly, but also the community in which we reside. And now with things so connected that we, that includes greater society uh, and the uh, and the inter enterprise, the employers and, and the employees and the partners as well. So this gets closer to the things we would read in many in many descriptions of what the underlying thinking of, of the Toyota way is. And then finally, now we get to the actions. This is the fun part where you get into more of the tools, tools and techniques, the things that we would do. Again, the details of PDCA, which is such a wonderful thing. PDCA is kind of the engine. That, that, that drives lean, lean activity in an organization. So how do we then uh, embody this idea of respecting humanity uh, in the design of work? Uh, how do we become great at scientific thinking, great at PDCA, at Kaizen? <laughs> and then specific things you can add. This could be a very long list. This is not intended to be exhaustive at all, just some examples. How can we engage people? And again, this idea of questioning, questioning more than telling. Sometimes you tell. But questioning tends to be a way to really engage people more diff more deeply. Their mind and also their volition can be engaged better by questioning uh, most, most of the time. Most of the time. Uh, it's some, it can be top down. It can be quite bottom up, middle out. And very often, as we look at an enterprise level, we might build momentum through small successes, starting small, going big. But that's just a general rule. It's not always uh, not necessarily always the case. And so that's a breakdown, Dave, of those three kind of yeah. the, the logic flow there. Yeah. And uh, that, that I, I, what we're finding can really help us understand what it is we're doing in a company, uh, what our organization is doing, and also individuals that can understand not just the, 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 the specifics that they're learning in terms of tools and techniques, but the why behind those and view them as part of an overall system. So if it gets into this final, this next class and then this next slide, and then David, I'd like to ask, you know, you know, you to join in again. But I think 
what we can say that is this is what it is and, and its purpose for the most part is, as far as how we use it. And in terms of how we use it, sometimes it's not explicit up front at all. It may be something, these are just questions that we hold as we think about how a company needs to go about uh, making the change, changes that they need to make. But most effectively, it's a structure for self-reflection. This isn't a go do this kind of thing. It's something that people can use to self-reflect, to define the gap between their current and desired states. It says of your transformation efforts, it could be your formation efforts just as well. So there's lean transformation, there's lean formation uh, as, as well. And then, and I, I do think this is true, that self-reflection is critical to creating specific situational approaches that avoid uh, the hammer looking for a nail copying, which I think is just rampant. Uh, as I look at uh, uh, you know implementations of lean around the world over many decades, uh, this is just uh, just such a it's a, such a common problem that I think it's one that that deserves special attention. What do you think, Dave? Yeah, I think so, and I, and I think um, uh, you know I think there aren't just there isn't just that one thing as a failure mode. Qu- are- just just quickly, so so it, so that's kind of like summary, really, of of, of, the, of the high level. But then there's questions under questions. Yes. So, so, so as you start asking a question, that actually opens up to more questions, really, doesn't it? That's, that's, the, that's the idea of this. So you know, how are we designing, doing, and improving the work? And have you defined the work to be done? Is it being improved? How? By what means? By what methods? So, so you, what you're doing is you're thinking about lean thinking while you're doing those questions. I think that's, that's, that's what, right. we're, that's that's what right. we're saying, isn't it? So second that's level right. questions, and then actually there's some third level questions. So, you know, so some of these high and live, mid-level uh, challenges, uh, they're defined and the questions are geared to address the issue in the situation. That's essentially what we're, what we're saying. So, um, so gaps to close. And, and this idea of, um, you know, in practical problem solving or in business practices, it's always about trying to think about the gap. What's, what, what's the problem to solve? What's the gap to, to close and, and all that kind of thing. So, so let, let's, let's just um, talk us through this. This, 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 is, this is really great. Well, just very briefly, and again, this goes back to my experience at, at, at New Me and looking at GM and other companies, that it's easy to see what we do and start to copy those things. But under, underneath all the artifacts, the things we do, there are values and attitudes that aren't quite so easy to see. And underneath that is... You call it culture, so what do I have here, or the basic thinking, your fundamental thinking that informs that. And what I found at, at uh, NUMI was that, uh, at, counter to what I had studied in, in, in the school, studying industrial anthropology, where I thought you would change, try to change the culture and get everyone on board, and then their values and attitudes would get to be the right, become the right thing, and they would do the right thing. Well, it's not, there, there's an opposite way of approaching it that I think is characteristic of lean. This is a lean through, this is a learn through doing approach. It's easier to act your way to a new way of thinking than to think your way to a new way of acting. But if you click one more time, uh, that does not mean that we don't want to change the way we think. We must. It is a thinking production system. So then you get into how to change our thinking and our culture. And that's going to be situational, depending on the problem we need to solve. I create software for uh, iPhones. Uh, no, I actually build you know circuits that go into iPhones. I build cars. I work for the government. I've done some work, actually, with the state of Washington uh, government. That's a different situation. The circumstances being worked in, problems to be solved are quite different. So how you bring the thinking to bear uh, can vary. But then what do we need to do to bring about the, uh, the, the change? And as we do it, the next slide, uh, we want to do it with, the, uh, with an understanding that we need to have some balance between people and process or social and technical, to use more of an academic uh, turn on it. Um, and it's management that's going to balance those based upon the, a, a, a solid purpose. That purpose isn't set and consistent with what we're trying to change to. It will not hold. This is what happened at General Motors back in the days. The purpose of the organization was not the same as Toyota's, even though they're in the same industry. Um, and simply trying to paste a TPS-like system on top of what their purpose was with a, with a, very, with a very different leadership style and management system uh, did not work. So we need to align all these things. And I think you'll see that this is very consistent with what uh, Mr. Steele was saying this morning. Mm-hmm. Okay. So tell us about transformation support then. Okay. Very, uh, very quickly. So Dan said something to uh, Dan Jones uh, to us uh, years ago that I think was really helpful. 
which is the value of any external support of any lean transformation is determined by what happens after the support ends. I think that's true. Let's say, uh, let's say I'm a consultant working for McKinsey. Let's say I walk in and I do some stuff and I do some stuff. It might look very, I might achieve certain, you know, outcomes that are good. But what you can only judge that intervention based on what happens after I leave, after we leave, after the support ceases. If that's the case, we need to determine what needs to happen for that to happen. We want a sustaining, a self-reliant enterprise to be to to come out of this. And from that, we use the you know the, you can take the idea that I, I kind of took that to to extend that to the to the notion that any outside support should be defined by the answer to those two questions first of all. <laughs> Uh, and then define those ideal target conditions. And then support should be defined as we, we should be sensei or coaches uh, or consultants should go in as little as possible, as much as necessary. And getting that balance right is not such an easy thing to do. That 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 is something that I've seen only experience kind of teaches. Uh, very often, this is too much of one or the other. It's either, either too much support. Or some of our friends at McKenzie have often go in with a whole team of people doing too much, I would say, in my view. Other times, though, uh, there's not enough because it's true it's, that, that, as many have noted, I've never we haven't seen uh, really a wall to wall great, you know, lean transformation go very far without uh, the support of some sort of outside sensei. I would like to think that it is possible, but uh, for the most part, it seems to be often necessary. OK, right. So we'll just summarize in terms of some of the some of the things, the, the key failure modes. So, um, yes. Yeah. So, so one of the things that we see, one of the things we try to do with the LTF is be conscious about the potential failure modes um, of applying lean thinking in practice so that we can avoid them. And there are lots of potential failure modes. So that these, these isn't, this isn't an, an exclusive list. Um, so, um, you know, not least building reliance from the outside would be, would be one of those. Um, I'm always conscious That's of right. the as little as possible, as much as necessary principle. Um, and here are some other ones that we see frequently. So first of all, uh, you already mentioned this, saying we need to do lean, but not clear, being clear on the purpose for doing it. Uh, secondly, focusing too much on the technical and in ignoring the social. Um, and conversely, focusing on the social and, and avoiding the, uh, and, and ignoring the technical. Um, one of the uh, the other ones um, is thinking about going uh, broad, really, really broad. Um, and if you can say this without losing your teeth, the inch deep, mile wide approach versus the inch mile wide, wide deep approach. Trying to go too fast, so outstripping an organisation's capacity for learning versus going too slow and then losing momentum. Those are typical things that we see, you know, the torts and the hair, you know. Um, or letting uh, perfection be, in, be the enemy of better. Or settling for better and not really thinking enough about perfection. So these are qu the quite opposite ty type, of, type of things. Um, and so, go, uh, the, the, the last slide, not, not being mindful of culture or underlying thinking, or actually being too cautious of your culture and not thinking enough about how it links to purpose and what you're actually trying to do. And then the last one is losing sight that actually lean is just a means to solve problems at every level as in the fractal nature in every activity. I think that's, that's right, isn't it? So, um, what we're all really concerned about in this room is a sustainable transformation. Re really self-reliance, building self-reliance in, in, into, into what we do. Being able to do this for ourselves, that's what we really, really need to be, be, uh, be thinking about. And um, when we started approaching this with reference to the Lean Transformation Framework, um, we, we recognised that actually the best examples that we ever see are where the leaders take the time to teach and coach their teams. 
When this is done by somebody outside, it's pretty questionable as to whether it actually takes hold. Um, you know, and I think it's really, this is great for me because uh, we've got kind of like 20 years of car retailers in here. We've got, where's Pedro Simao? Where's Pedro Simao? So Pedro Simao is the first lean dealer. He, he was in Lean Solutions. Um, and Torge Halverson, who's just about to retire, he went to see Pedro Simao and he became Toyota's most profitable dealer in Europe. And he took his team to Sharon at Halfway. And, and so, so, you know, so it's great. This is great for me because I've got like 25 years of these people. And they're, they're all successful people at doing lean. And um, the, the thing that I, I really think is really key is that as leaders, they taught their teams. They didn't abdicate that responsibility for, for and, and they, let, they led it. So, um, so when we were thinking about this in terms of material and in terms of developing learning processes, what we need are learning processes that enable leaders to be able to teach their teams. And that's why we, 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 we've been doing all of this work on this teach poster method to basically make a method that's simple enough for leaders to be able to teach and coach others. That, 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 that's kind of like the idea. Okay, so, right, we're, 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 we're pretty close to, uh, well, we actually, we've just run over. Um, do you, do you want to talk about that a little bit, about a process for using LTF linked to PDCA? I, 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 think, I think it's, I'll just say that it's, it's just, it's, again, it's, it's a way to think about, so PDCA is so easy to say, so hard to do, uh, especially on a bigger level and a longer term. There's short cycle PDCA, which is easy, easier. <laughs> it's also not that easy. Uh, on a given process, how to improve that, you know, it can kind of look like a scientific method is the way we usually think of it, but it can also cascade up into something that takes longer, it can take years, um, and it can work at a, at a higher level. So I think this is simply a way to construct higher level PDCA, uh, you know, experiments. But I think, Dave, this next one, even if it's 30 seconds for you to share the, the example is the way oh, you can, yeah, people sure, can yeah, understand yeah, yeah, yeah. it. Okay. Yeah, so, so, so this, this actually, it's a brief case. So John first talked about LTF in 2014 uh, publicly, um, but but uh, but I've used these car dealers for 25 years. I'm not that old, really, honest. I, I was a baby when, when we started. Um, I've used car dealers basically because I've got good knowledge of the work, and I, and I find it easy to know that work. I worked in a garage when I was a kid, and my dad had a garage, and. Uh, I just like cars, really. So that, that's, that, that's, that's what, why it's easy. It's easy to, to do. Um, so, but I've used the car retailers basically as a skunk works to test stuff. So, so what I did was when John started talking about this, I, it, it really resonated with me in terms of using the LTF. And um, so we were very fortunate we had this project and uh, you, you can see on the left hand side of this slide it's written up quite a lot in the Lean Global Network's online magazine called Planet Lean, uh, the halfway case and there's all sorts of stuff in there about sales and service and, and different things. And what we did was we developed a process to use the LTF questions to see how we were going in their eight Toyota dealers. So, so it was eight Toyota dealers, and we didn't do the same thing in every site, because what we wanted to do is we wanted to test things that worked, and so we wanted variables that we kept static and variables that we changed, so that we could then see whether there was an impact on those as we went through the change in each site. And I think the, the thing that's really great is that they came up with their own version of the LTF. That, that, that's the, the house. They call it actually the halfway house. Um, I, I'm not sure whether it leads you to drink or not. So, but but, um, but, but it's, it, it's this, this idea of actually making visible what they were trying to do across all of the different dimensions. 
But the really interesting bit in this, and I think this is the takeaway, really, uh, that, I, that I like you all to, to take away as a, as a challenge, really. When we looked at each site, across each site, some sites did quite well. Other sites didn't do quite well. And what we saw was we, we saw alignment. So, so, so the interesting thing is, of course, you need all five dimensions, or you need activity on all five dimensions to have a successful change. That's one of the key points of the, of the process. However, the most successful sites in the halfway group, in the halfway Toyota dealers that were doing stuff, had much better alignment vertically between purpose, their management system, and their underlying thinking, than the people who actually had very good alignment between the work, understanding the work to be done, the management system, and developing capability. So my challenge to you, as we kind of close, is go and try this out and just see. You know, it's very simple to do, and 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 you know, you can see on the picture here. Um, we just had the house, and the guy stuck the post-its on the, on the house to understand where they were, and then there was a big discussion about it, and then they finally formalized their, their plans. But try applying these five questions to your situation and just see whether you can see whether actually vertically it's better or horizontally is it better. Have you got hot spots? things that you're very, very good at and things that you're, you're not very good at. That's the challenge to take away. And don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel for the latest lean content.